We are going to be looking at Scripture this morning as we're working through the doctrines of grace, and the acronym TULIP is functioning as our outline for the five weeks we'll be together. Uh, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints is our outline. And as we talked a little bit last week, not all of those labels are particularly helpful. And so uh, we'll sort of undo the acronym a little bit as we go through. But uh, it's familiar enough, and again, it's hard to spell TULIP uh, with other letters. So uh, we'll stick with it as a, as a guiding outline. Um, but but we'll, um, we'll be a little bit more specific with some of the labels. This morning, the U can stand, unconditional election. This is a great description of God's sovereign choice of those who will be saved. Unconditional simply means it is not predicated on any condition in the ones saved, but is predicated wholly and totally in the purposes of God. Now, if you're anything like me, uh, you may not have been saved believing in unconditional election. For me, I experienced something of a new birth into the doctrines of grace after by new birth, which actually saved me. In fact, the gospel that I heard, the gospel that I believed was simple, clear, straightforward, and biblically true. I needed a savior. I was a sinner. And Jesus died in my place. A very simple, clear gospel. But that came in the theological context of the, the churches I was in and the people I was around and the things that were read and the things that I had read. That that decision to follow Jesus came out of my own natural ability, even my own free will. I had a misunderstanding of the will, a, a mis understanding of the notion of freedom and slavery. Uh, frankly, I did not understand the T in TULIP or the Bible's description of what it means to be totally depraved. And as we looked at last week, that is the effect of sin, the infection of sin through every constituent part of the constitution of man. Uh, that is, sin is not just outward activities, things that you do that are bad, but those outward activities flow from a nature, an internal, thoroughgoing corruption that affects every aspect of who a human being is. Outward activities, inward thoughts, motivations, affections, how we think, all of those are affected and infected by sin, all resulting in a total and spiritual death from which no dead person can recover himself. I didn't understand those things early in my Christian life, but I did know that I was a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus was my only hope. And listen, the gospel that saved you will probably never be completely understood by you. So I just want to be clear up front, as we talk about the doctrines of grace and, and honing our thinking, refining our thinking to a closer approximation of God's truths, I'm not sure we ever actually get there because some of the things we're dealing with have infinitely weighty significance and we have finite puny brains. Not even eternity will bring us all the answers to the fullness of all the questions we might ask about salvation. And so a fullness, a full understanding and 100% accurate biblical comprehension of how I got saved is not demanded for the fact that I did get saved, right? Who is it that saves a sinner? Christ saves a sinner. A sinner's perfect understanding of the gospel does not save the sinner. Uh, Jesus Christ saves. So uh, just up front, we, we need to make sure that, that we are not thinking about the doctrines of grace in terms of some theological leverage against others who don't believe everything we will articulate this morning. Uh, that would be a crying shame for us not to be, in fact, humbled by these doctrines. These are the most humbling doctrines there are, uh, to use them as a bludgeon against other believers uh, would be problematic. It's kind of like the guy who quits smoking today, who's angry with everybody else who's still smoking. And, and you turn around and you think, how, how could you do such a thing? For us to love the sovereignty of God and salvation, 
and be sinfully upset or critically judgmental of those who don't yet quite understand all of it in its details the way that we think that we do? Would itself be arrogant sin, not in keeping with having been saved by a big God gospel? So these things, just as a reminder, ought to keep us humble. So if you're like me, you probably heard the word election in Christian circles, maybe heard the phrase, the chosen, describing believers in Christian circles, and, and you may have had a number of different thoughts about what that word election might mean. I know that I did, and the first sort of theological circle I swam in, election was simple. God votes for you, Satan votes against you, and you cast the deciding vote. It's an election right? We think about polling places and voting booths. No, that, that's not the kind of election that's in view in the Bible, but, but that is what I adhered to early on. A second iteration of my theological development in the doctrine of election uh, was the Arminian view that God looks down the corridors of time and he sees those who would choose him. And on the basis of sinner's choice to believe the gospel, God chooses them. So God may choose them before time, but he does so looking down the corridors of time. And so the logical basis for salvation is the free will of the sinner choosing God from his natural abilities. Or in, in some constructions of Arminian doctrine from a, a, a sort of what I would call a fabricated prevenient grace. That is a supernatural enabling that's available to everybody indiscriminately that they could overcome spiritual death and therefore choose but it still ends up back in the same place uh, it started. So that was my second definition of election. God looking down the corridors of time, choosing those who would choose him. And then there is a, perhaps a third definition of election you may have come across. And it's simply that God graciously chooses some to be saved. And I'll, I'll give the wording from uh, MacArthur and Mayhew's Systematic Theology Biblical Doctrine, which I would commend to you. Here's the definition they offer. Election is the free and sovereign choice of God made in eternity past to set his love on certain individuals and on the basis of nothing in themselves, but solely because of the good pleasure of his will to choose them to be saved from sin and damnation and to inherit the blessings of eternal life through the mediatorial work of Christ. So again, there is one truly free will in the universe. Although when we talk about a free will, we're talking about that which is constrained by someone's nature and attributes. God's will is free from any external contrivance, any slavery apart from his own purpose and being. And God freely chooses those who will be saved out of his goodness and love towards those who do not deserve it, could not earn it, could not choose it for themselves. The bottom line on the doctrine of election, of unconditional election, is that it answers the problem of total depravity. If sin is a thoroughgoing corruption affecting everything in the constituent parts of man, including the will, the ability, the thought processes, in addition to the affections and motivations that generate outward sins, if that is the biblical doctrine of total depravity, which it is, we looked at last week, the only solution to such problems would be a sovereign initiating work of God, unconditioned on any natural ability, which couldn't be good, in the sinner who is to be saved. So as, as we think about um, unconditional election, let's just take a step back and think again about God's absolute sovereignty. Because really, that is the umbrella, the godness of God. That is, God is king. God is in charge. Because God is God, he's sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over the big picture and meticulously sovereign over the details. There's not a rogue molecule in the universe, as R.C. Sproul said. That's going to help us think about the, the doctrine of sovereignty applied to salvation. Let's remind ourselves a little bit from Daniel 4.35. God's dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, 
But God does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? This is God's absolute, overarching, and meticulous sovereignty over all things. And consider the testimony of Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 11. The prophet records this. God says, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there was no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly, I have spoken. Truly, I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely, I will do it. And what's striking about that Isaiah 46 testimony is that it involves the moral agency and earthly activities of human beings on the earth who have a will, who do what they want to do. And in and through those independent uh, moral agents, those actors on the earth, God is accomplishing his purposes. And he always gets what he purposes to do. So that absolute sovereignty goes over all things. And we need to think about that sovereignty applied to the doctrine of salvation. How does God's sovereignty in salvation work out? Listen to the testimony of God's word. You can turn to these or just listen in. And again, like last week, if you would like a copy of my notes so that you have all of these references, you don't have to uh, get carpal tunnel syndrome uh, trying to write all these down, uh, just email me or text me. I'd be happy to send you the notes. Ephesians 1.4, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1.11, he does this according to his purpose, the one who works all things after the counsel of his will. Ephesians 2.8 says, it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And turn with me to Acts 13.48. It's helpful to see the sovereignty of God and salvation actually played out in the course of human events. Uh, sometimes the objection is given, well, if, if God is sovereign in salvation, if election before the foundation of the world is true, if predestination and foreknowledge are true, then doesn't that make us automatons? Doesn't that make me just a robot? And what we find throughout the testimony of Scripture is human beings, moral agents with wills and intentions and affections and desires, go about their business and do what they want to do. And that very idea is compatible with God's sovereignty. And it's helpful to see that played out in Scripture. This is not some sort of ivory tower abstract idea, like a, like a philosophical fatalism. No, this is relational, personal, involves real people in real circumstances, and it's just helpful to see how these things work out in real life. So Acts 13, 48 gives this remarkable testimony. Paul is talking about the task of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Verse 47, the Lord has commanded us, I've placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And listen to this, as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Did you catch that? As many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. The same number who had been appointed to eternal life is the same number of people who believed. Appointing is God's work. Belief involves the will, the activity, the mind, the heart of man. And we already alluded to Ephesians 2.8, uh, where that belief itself is a gift, but that gift does not circumvent the will and the affections and the desires of man. God appoints to eternal life, and they believe. That's real life, real circumstance, not abstract. Listen to John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, says Jesus, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Everyone that the Father gives to the Son, they will come to him. And you think, well, doesn't that involve the human will? Isn't the human will fickle? 
And here, the sovereignty of God overrules a fickle human will and actually brings to Jesus all that the Father has. Again, these things are compatible. It doesn't make us robots. The, the sinner still desires Christ. The fundamental question in election is, why does the sinner decide to love Christ all of a sudden? Because God loved first. Because God chose. I love to ask people when they've sort of had this new birth experience in the doctrines of grace, um, tempted to sort of undo, well, what, did I learn, what did I know before theologically? It must all be wrong. You know that song we used to sing? I have decided to follow Jesus. Can a Calvinist sing that song? I love asking that question. Did you decide to follow Jesus? No, the, 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 the new Calvinist in me says I, I shouldn't say that. But the reality is, yes. If you're a Christian, there, there is a moment where you weren't following Jesus, and there was another moment where you did follow Jesus, and that transition didn't happen apart from you deciding. The question is not whether you decided to follow Jesus or not. If you're following Jesus, then yes, of course, you decided to follow Jesus. And you can sing that song and you can say, no turning back, no turning back. It's a good song. Now, if we stop and ask the question, why did you, dead in your transgressions and sins, convince that Jesus was boring or offensive or a stumbling block to your own sense of self-gratification and personal happiness? Why did you, of all people, all of a sudden decide to follow Jesus? And when you come to the doctrines of grace, you say, oh, God new birthed me. He didn't go around my will and my decision-making process. His grace went straight through it like a freight chain and transformed me from the inside. Yes, I have decided to follow Jesus. And from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. No boasting. Sing the song. Boast in Christ. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Uh, we'll come back to John uh, 6, when we discover uh, the effectual calling of God, or what we might call irresistible grace, if we're trying to spell the name of a flower. Uh, and we'll come back to it again in perseverance of the saints, or the preservation of the saints, or eternal security under P in the word tulip. Turn to Acts 16, 14. Perhaps one page to the right of where we just were. And listen to this testimony. Again, not abstract, ivory tower, uh, you know, th theological things that have no import in real life. This is real life, a real woman, God's sovereignty in salvation. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Now, this is a, just a really remarkable scene. She is by a riverside. Uh, this is outside of Philippi. There are, there are not enough Jews in this uh, province, in this colony, to actually form a synagogue. And yet you have an Old Testament style God-fearer a worshiper of God, according to the Old Testament testimony, a, a Gentile woman adhering to Israel for the sake of getting close to Israel's God. And what happens here? Paul is preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, to some Jews gathered and God-fearers first. Lydia is among them, and the Lord opens her heart to respond to the things Paul was saying about Jesus the Christ. What do you have there? God's sovereignty and Lydia's response, both in play. They're, they're not a contradiction. Uh, somebody asked uh, uh, Spurgeon one time, how do you reconcile God's sovereignty and human responsibility? He said, why would I have to reconcile friends? <laughs> uh, they're not at odds with each other. They go together in the scriptures and they go together on the pages of scripture. And you who have, born again, who have been born again by the grace of God, have already experienced how these things go together. 
Listen to John 10, 27 and 29. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus said, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. You see here the uh, multiple members of the triune Godhead are sovereign in salvation. God chooses, Jesus goes and rescues, and no one can snatch Jesus' sheep out of his own hand, and no one can snatch them out of his Father's hand. He's greater than all. 1 Corinthians 1 says this, By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you. This testimony happens throughout the pages of the Bible. Philippians 1.29, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake to believe in Him. It has been granted for Christ's sake for you to believe in Him. In 1 Thessalonians 5.9, God has destined us for obtaining salvation. We see God's sovereignty in salvation. Let's talk next as another heading this morning for thinking about unconditional election. Let's think together about the sovereignty of God in salvation through means, through means. That is, you you have an end and you have means to that end. What does God use? What does God employ to get those whom he chooses unto belief and eternal life? God uses means. God uses means to make the gospel known. God uses means to accomplish his purposes. Um, Let's think about this just in terms of sovereignty outside of the realm of salvation for a moment. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. Again, this goes back to the question of of God using means, accomplishing his sovereign purposes, and humans do what they want to do. Uh, This is what theologians call compatibilism. That is, divine sovereignty and human responsibility are compatible in the scriptures. This is the story of Abraham, Abram, Abraham, and Sarah. And uh, they keep going into foreign territory, and Abram's scared because his beautiful wife is going to be stolen by some powerful king. And he lies and um, deceives. Abraham, verse 2 of Genesis 20, said to Abimelech, She's my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. I don't think that turned out the way he hoped it would. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Did he not himself say to me, she's my sister, and she herself said, he's my brother? In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I've done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and also I kept you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her. (laughs) Here Abraham is saying, look, he, he said she was his sister, and I didn't do anything. And God says, I know, and I didn't let you. That is a remarkable window into the behind the scenes of what's happening in every single human decision. Here the curtain is pulled back a little bit and we see how God is sovereignly accomplishing all of his good purposes through the entire scope of human history, even while men on the earth scurry about doing what they want to do. God gets his good This is why we can believe things like Genesis 50, 20. Joseph said to his brothers, you meant this for evil. God meant this, the same this, the same it in Genesis 50, 20, for good to bring about this present result. You unfold the good that's in view in Genesis 50, 20, and you recognize it wasn't just about rescuing Joseph from prison or making him the second-hand guy in Egypt, or even of rescuing uh, Joseph's family from famine, or of even rescuing the entire nation of Egypt from famine. 
It, it was about much more than that. It was about incubating the seed promise nation under the world superpower at that time so that they would not be destroyed by marauding bandits and armies. They would grow to a force of some 2 million people before God took them out of Egypt. And amongst those people was what had already been promised to one of Joseph's brothers, Judah, a seed descent and a line of a lion who would come and forgive sins. You understand what's going on and the good that God was bringing about in Genesis 50, 20. The brothers intended to throw Joseph in a hole, maybe kill him, sell him off to slavery. That's all evil stuff. And God meant all of those same things for good to bring about the present help to the people and frankly for us personally to bring about forgiveness of sin through the seed line promise through the line of Judah in Jesus the Christ. That is a lot of human decision making over the span of human history that God is sovereign over to bring about what he promised to do from before time began. And when we think about God's sovereignty and human responsibility in terms of salvation, we recognize that God uses means, human means, human decision making, even to bring about his purposes. And God doesn't need perfect instruments to bring about his perfect purposes. What the brothers meant for evil, God meant for good. Romans 8, 28, God is causing all things to work together for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. God uses bad, faulty, lame instruments. He uses sin. In fact, to bring about the salvation of sinners, God had to use the greatest sin ever committed, deicide. The, the murder of God in the flesh to bring it about our salvation. Uh, these things go together. So what is the relationship between God's sovereign unconditional election and our evangelism? Have you thought about that? Have you, have you ever heard the argument, well, why evangelize if election? Right? And, and Spurgeon had to combat what became known as a hyper-Calvinism. Ian Murray's written an entire book called Spurgeon versus Hyper-Calvinism. It is a remarkable read because Charles Spurgeon himself was a five-point Calvinist by self-acclamation, and yet he was a rabid evangelist. Those two things were not at odds. They weren't at odds for him. In fact, Spurgeon took to task those who said, us four and no more. If God wants to save anybody, he'll just do it. When the Bible is very clear that the way God saves people is by the beautiful feat of proclamation of evangelists and ambassadors who go and plead with people to turn to Christ. God uses means. Here's a letter from Henry Martin, a missionary, and this is recorded in William Carey's biography. Henry Martin said this, Yet through the support and power of God, I am willing to continue throwing in the net at the Lord's command through all the long night of life, though the end may be that I have caught nothing. Of course, God used Henry Martin in tremendous ways to bring many people to Christ across multiple generations. But he was willing to be God's means. However, God sovereignly chose to use those means to God's end. He was going to be faithful. He was committed to the idea of God's sovereignty in salvation, and he was a committed evangelist and missionary. J.I. Packer, in his really helpful book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, said this, Evangelism is man's work, but the giving of faith is God's. How does evangelism work if election is true? Well, don't you wish there was something like an evangelism or an election tattoo that could be seen with some evangelist black light. You know, if you've hunted scorpions in your backyard with a black light, they, they show up and they glow. Couldn't it just be that the elect have like an E on their, on their right arm and you walk around with an evangelistic black light and find the elect and say, okay, now I'm going to preach the gospel to you. And it doesn't work that way. How do evangelists discover Jesus' sheep for whom he laid down his life? Preach the gospel indiscriminately to everything that moves and see who responds. And listen, not all the elect will respond when you preach the gospel to them. God may bring about somebody else after you. 
We just have the task of evangelism. Just thinking out loud, what are some reasons to evangelize? Why should we evangelize? We can do a little back and forth here this morning. Why share the gospel? Okay, we're commanded to. We were absolutely commanded to. Uh, the Great Commission given in Matthew 28, go therefore, and the, the go, though it's participial in grammatical form, carries the imperatival weight of the lead verb, which is make disciples. You can't make disciples standing on this mountain. So make disciples, going, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. That is a command given to the apostles, and that isn't complete until people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people believe all the way to the end of the age, and Jesus is there with power and authority for that very task. Disciple-making, disciple-making disciples leads that task right down into our very laps. Absolutely commanded. Uh, Paul told Timothy, in fact, do the work of an evangelist. Right? Pastors aren't off the hook in that one. So it's a command. Uh, what's another reason to share the gospel? Yeah, love of people. Thanks, Steve. Just compassion for people in a pitiable plight. What does it mean to have mercy? The idea of mercy, it carries with it the idea of pity. Someone is in a miserable state, and I want to give them help. Listen, you, believer, have the only help there is for sinners enslaved to death and destruction. So we go because people need it. Why else? What's another reason to evangelize? It is straight worship. Look, you, you tell people how great your Savior is. Thank you, Scott. It is doxological. It, it, it just glorifies God to stand in front of people who may never respond and say, God is so glorious. He is perfect and he's holy. And he has sent a son of his love in love for sinners so that anyone who believes can have eternal life. He is generous and gracious and offers life. That glorifies God. It reflects his own heart. Hey, what's another reason? It's exactly right, Ashley. Evangelism is God's means by which God will actually bring sinners to himself. We have every incentive in the world believing that God is sovereign to evangelize. In fact, we have more incentive to preach the gospel knowing that God will actually save his own through the means of preaching the gospel than if we thought somehow that people only got to heaven if I were effective in evangelism. And, and I used to believe that. To my own shame, I, I volunteered as a counselor uh, at an at a altar call at a Christian concert, I did this a number of times, but I distinctly remember uh, leading someone in a sinner's prayer and working hard to say just the right words, to, to have them echo the exact words and then seal the deal, had them sign a card and then grant them on the spot assurance that now they possessed eternal life. And, and this was a, a friend from my high school, who to my knowledge is not walking with the Lord today. And, and at the time, I just thought there is, a, there is a formula, there's a program, there are things that you say, and if you have the right skill, you just make the thing happen. And they make a decision for Christ, and you've done it. And, and salvation is not a human work like that. Bill Hybels, a number of years ago, preached at the Bible college while I was a student and said, give me long enough with anybody and I can unlock their heart. I can find the key that will unlock their heart and bring them to salvation. That is an arrogant, man-centered view of what must happen at new birth. But the free invitation of the gospel to everything that moves and the proclamation of Christ and all of his glorious salvific work is actually what God uses to miraculously, supernaturally transform a sinner's heart so that they believe and immediately possess eternal life. It's God's means. Let's think about foreordination and prayer. Prayer. 
I don't know if you've uh, contemplated this, had this question, or maybe heard this protest. The argument is often put forward. Belief in the sovereignty of God eliminates the need for prayer. And since prayer is biblical, the sovereignty of God and salvation is therefore unbiblical. Have you heard that? Maybe another way it's posed is, why pray if God is sovereign? And, and really, we ought to turn that on its head. We, we could ask the contrary question, why pray if God is not sovereign? Right? What, what in the world are you asking God to do? If he's not the sovereign Lord of the universe, able actually to transform the will. If he's not able to raise the dead, if he's not able to make Lazarus walk out of the tomb or, or make the lame man leap or the blind man see or the deaf hear, what are you praying for? And I've contemplated this a lot. You know, um, if, if, if evangelism and salvation depended totally on us, we should not waste our time praying whatsoever. We should spend our time coming up with every contrivance possible to convince the will of man to change. Prayer is an implicit, absolute dependence on a sovereign God who is willing to actually save sinners and effectively draw them to himself. Listen to the words of J.I. Packer. You pray for the conversion of others. In what terms now do you intercede for them? Do you limit yourself to asking that God will bring them to a point where they can save themselves independently of him? I do not think you do. I think that what you do is to pray in categorical terms that God will, quite simply and decisively, save them. That he will open the eyes of their understanding, soften their hard hearts, renew their natures, move their wills to receive the Savior. You ask God to work in them everything necessary for their salvation. You would not dream of making it a point in your prayer that you are not asking God actually to bring them to faith because you recognize that's something that God cannot do. God would never violate their free will. Not asking you to do that, God. No, we're praying that God would overwhelm their will, transform their will. Nothing of the sort, J.I. Packer continues. When you pray for unconverted people, you do so on the assumption that it is in God's power to bring them to faith. You entreat him to do that very thing, and your confidence in asking rests upon the certainty that he's able to do what you ask. And you can turn perhaps later this afternoon to Exodus 32 and see that remarkable scene where Moses intercedes on behalf of rebellious Israelites and changes God's mind. That's what the text says. God changed his mind as a result of Moses' prayer. You think, wait a second. Uh, God doesn't change. Um, except you have a text that says God changed his mind. And we just need to carefully understand what that means and what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God changed in his fundamental attributes, nor his promises, nor his eternal purposes, nor his own wise counsel in sovereignly orchestrating all events that come to pass. What does it mean that God changed his mind? God changed his disposition towards his people, threatening judgment and relenting in that same judgment. God changed not from doing one thing to another, but frankly, God changed from threatening judgment to fulfilling his promise. You see, the, the threat in Exodus 32 was God said to Moses up on the mountain, Moses, you stay here with me. I'm going to wipe out all of those people and I'll make a new nation out of you. And that provokes Moses to pray on the basis of what God had already promised and purposed. By the way, again, uh, back to the Joseph narrative, if God wiped out the people and made a new nation out of Moses, Moses is not in the line of Judah. Judah's wiped out the promise of a lion from the tribe of Judah who would fulfill the seed promise of Genesis 3.15 to crush the head of the snake and forgive sin and reverse the curse and bring sinful humanity back to God in reconciliation goes out the window. So what is God doing here in Exodus 32? He is provoking intercessory prayer, which becomes the means under God's sovereign control of bringing about his eternal purposes. God uses prayer just like God uses evangelism. Think about predestination and missions. What is the connection between the Great Commission, Matthew 28, and the assembly of heaven, Revelation 5, 9 to 10? There are the 
throne of the Lamb is surrounded by people from tongues and tribes and nations and peoples. How do they get there? From 11 scared guys on the top of a hill. To the throne of heaven surrounded by people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. How do they get there? They, they get there through missions. They get there through the church in expansion through the church age. They get there through Romans 10. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word about Christ. We might debate whether or not Calvin was a Calvinist. I mean, you know, the, the five points emerged long after Calvin went home to be with the Lord. But we might debate about whether we could use that label at all. Sometimes labels are helpful, sometimes they're unhelpful. I would suggest not calling yourself a Calvinist until you've read Calvin's Institutes. Then you might decide whether or not you would take the label. If you believe in the five points of the doctrines of grace, or four of them, or four and a half of them, or four and three quarter, wherever you find yourself, um, it, it's okay to call yourself a Christian. It's okay to call yourself a lover of God's grace. And sometimes I know we say, well, are, are you Calvinistic in your thinking? And it's sort of shorthand for, do we believe God is sovereign in salvation? I don't think we mean it's shorthand for, do we baptize babies or do we persecute heretics or those kinds of things. That, we have something specific in mind. And so when we think about um, Calvinism, it certainly predates a guy named Jean Calvin. Right? It predates John Calvin. It predates Augustine on whom he leaned theologically, and it predates the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. These truths go back before time. But I want you to think about, about Jesus as a quote-unquote Calvinist, a combination of sovereignty and invitation. We read from John 6 already, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws him. And yet Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And, he, and he's writing a personal letter to a lukewarm church. Lukewarm doesn't mean sort of mediocre. It just means totally worthless. And we'll get there when we look at the book of Revelation. The church at Laodicea he said, I'll spit you out of my mouth unless you repent. And he says, I stand at the door and knock. He who hears you will enter in and I will dine with him. I will come in and dine with you. A remarkable, gracious invitation. Jesus himself said, many are called, and that's not the effectual calling we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Many are called, meaning open invitation of the gospel to everything that moves, and few are chosen. There is this gracious, open, big-hearted, warm invitation from Jesus. The very one who knew he was, whom he was coming to lay down his life for. These things aren't at odds with each other. Think about the Apostle Paul who wrote Romans 9. Um, God wrote that through him. God's sovereignty and salvation is all over all of Paul's writings. And yet, listen to his plea in 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are ambassadors speaking as though God were making appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And you watch Paul's life and ministry. He says shocking things like, I wish that I could even be accursed for the sake of my brethren who, who, who naturally should love Christ, the Messiah from their own line, and they don't. Paul's heart was broken for those who didn't believe the gospel. Jesus' own heart was broken. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long have I, as a, as a mother hen, sought to bring you like chicks under my wings? Jesus' gracious, open invitation, Paul's gracious, open invitation, demonstrate what it truly means to believe God's sovereignty in salvation. And to think about what it means for you as a sinner saved you knew what it was like to be at enmity with God. 
to be hopeless, helpless, spiritually dead, and then what it was to be alive, that ought to produce a sort of natural outflowing of invitation with the confident recognition that God will get his people, particularly by the means of brokenhearted evangelists who plead with sinners to come to Christ. Listen to William Carey's perspective on this. This is an entry from William Carey's diary dated June 12th, 1806 in Calcutta. 5.45 to 7 a.m., dressed, read a chapter of the Hebrew Bible, devotions. 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., family worship in Bengali and with my servants. Read Persian with Munshi, that's a language teacher. Revised scripture proof in Hindustani, then breakfast. Translated a portion of the Ramayana from Sanskrit into English with the help of a Sanskrit pundit. 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., government college classes that he was teaching. 1.30 to 2 p.m., dinner. 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., revised a proof of Jeremiah chapter in Bengali. Translated most of Matthew 8 into Sanskrit with Mrityanjay's help. 6 to 7 p.m., T. Read Telugu with a pundit. A son of the Reverend Timothy Thomas of London came by. 7 to 9 p.m., prepared and preached an English sermon, about 40 present, including Judge Harrington, who afterwards responded to my plea and gave uh, 63 pounds, 10 shillings toward our Calcutta Chapel building fund. 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., translated Ezekiel 11 into Bengali, have cast aside my first edition translation completely, wrote a letter to Ryland, read a Greek Testament chapter, commended self to God, and he said at the end of this, I have never more time in a day than this. He was relentless. William Carey was a committed Calvinist. In fact, it was the doctrines of grace that spurned him on to becoming the father of modern missions. In fact, the great missionary movement out of Europe in William Carey's day came from churches that faithfully preached the doctrines of grace, produced missions. William Carey's son, William, also served as a missionary. Carey wrote to his son the following, The conversion of one soul is worth the labor of a life. Hold on, therefore, be steady in your work, and leave the result with God. Be encouraged, my dear son. Devote yourself wholly to your work, for this is the cause God has had in his mind from eternity, and for which Christ shed his blood, and for which the Spirit and the Word were given. So its triumph is certain. Many missionaries have been asked personally, why are you going to the heathen if God is sovereign and if you believe election is true? And many have responded with similar words as these. How could I go if he weren't sovereign? They knew that the victory, the guarantee was promised because of God's gospel. What remains in the notes, and if you want to get these, are just a series of texts on unconditional election, on predestination, and on foreknowledge. I won't read those for you here. I'll highlight a couple. Let me give you sort of a description of unconditional election. Since we are all totally depraved and totally unable and unwilling to change our condition, the fact is we are all running from God as fast as we can in our depravity. The scriptures overwhelmingly teach that God in his gracious sovereignty has chosen in eternity past to save sinners anyway from his wrath. The scriptures do not teach that God elects those he saves on the condition that he foresaw they would believe. Rather, before time, he sovereignly, lovingly, graciously, personally, and unconditionally elects them for his own sake and glory before the foundation of the world. In other words, one believes in Christ because he is elect by God. One is not elect because he believes. I turn to Romans chapter 8. We'll look at just one of these remarkable texts. And this is familiar. It begins with the familiar refrain, God causes all things to work together for good who love to those who love God or those who are called according to his purpose. And at every phase in my personal theological journey through these things, I have loved Romans 8.28 and believed in God's meticulous sovereignty over all events. Although there was a time where I did not believe God was meticulously sovereign over salvation. 
Because I believe that what God wanted to do was to protect human free will. That was territory he would not cross. That was ground he would not tread. He wanted to protect that. And, and if God left us to ourselves in our supposed free will, we would all remain dead, hopeless, and helpless. But meticulous sovereignty goes from all events being orchestrated by God for believers' good into this explanation beginning in verse 29. Follow along with me. For, explanatory conjunction, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he'd be the firstborn among many brethren. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What you have in Romans 8, 28 to 30 is an unbreakable chain of salvation from before time to eternity future. Notice that glorified at the end of the chain is in the past tense, even though it describes a future reality. That means it's as good as done in the mind and purpose and plan and outworking of God. It means that nobody falls through the cracks. There's no one who is foreknown, who is not also predestined to look like Jesus, who is not also effectually called in time, who is not also justified, that is declared righteous uh, in time in salvation, and who is also glorified. Nobody falls through the cracks. Nobody begins the process and doesn't finish the process. But I want you to recognize in verse 29, this word foreknew, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined. And this idea of foreknowledge might lead us down the corridors of philosophy to make us think that God looked down the corridors of time and saw who would choose him and therefore chose him. That is not what the word foreknowledge means. The, the word there is pro-gnosko. Gnosko is a relational, personal knowledge, and pro at the front of it just means beforehand. The, what's going on in Romans 8.29 is not a foreknowledge of facts or things or events or belief or decisions. It is a foreknowledge of persons. Intimate relational knowledge. Notice in this verse, it is those whom he foreknew. Not that he foreknew that somebody down a corridor would do something. No, those whom he foreknew. For new. A good synonym here for prognosco would be for loved. Those whom God personally, relationally set his affections on. And notice what's next in the chain. All those whom God foreloved, he predestined. And predestined is easier to understand. We understand destined, destiny, and pre at the front of it. Before time, destiny, it made into a verb. All those whom God set his affections on before time, he predestined. And what did he predestine them to? To be conformed to the image of his son, who'd be the firstborn, who would have the status of preeminent one in a household. Not that Jesus didn't exist and came into existence, but the firstborn status in a household. That Jesus would receive preeminence, that is one of the fundamental inter-Trinitarian purposes for our salvation, we start to realize salvation is a lot bigger than little old me and a decision I made. God set his affections and love on me before time began and destined me beforehand to look like Christ for the glory of the second person of the Trinity. And every single person whom he foreloved and predestined, he also called. We'll get to this in Irresistible Grace. That is the effectual call of God unto salvation that actually works. And everyone whom he called, he also justified, made a forensic declaration of righteousness. And everyone whom he declared righteous, he also glorified. Beginning to end, as good as done, before time to the end of time, God is sovereign. And look how this works out just a few verses down the page, Romans 8.33. Who then will bring a charge against God's elect? Rhetorical question. Nobody. Not Satan. Not your enemies. Not you. Certainly none of the angels in heaven. And not the Trinitarian Godhead. <laughs> Nobody. And, and look what follows. God is the one who justifies. 
no one can condemn. What makes you uncondemnable? Romans 8, 1, and unseparatable from the love of God in Christ Jesus, end of Romans 8. This unbreakable chain of salvation that began with election in eternity past. This is all of God. This is why Romans 11 concludes with the doxology from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. It's why when Paul talks about believers and writes letters to believers, like in 2 Thessalonians 2, he gives thanks to God for the brethren in Thessalonica, beloved by the Lord, because God chose them from the beginning for salvation. Why do we thank God for other people being saved? Shouldn't we dispense with that and just go around and thank people for a really good decision they made one day? No, we thank God that believers are believers because believers are believers only because God. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for this morning, for this reminder of your grace. We truly want to echo this glorious refrain that God saves sinners. It's all of you. We're humbled by these things. Oh God, keep us from being arrogant with biblical truth as if we came up with it, or as if we have some right to it or ownership of it, may these doctrines always lay us low. May they fuel prayer, evangelism, missions, labor, toil for your sake, for your churches building up, and for a lost world that needs the gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name.